Welcome back to the Art and Science of Real Estate Negotiation podcast. It's Tom Zeeb. Happy to have two fantastic people with me today. I have Stan and Angie. How are you guys? Excellent. Fantastic. Well, how about we start off with some introductions? Tell me about yourselves and what you do in real estate investing. Go ahead, Stan. Okay. Start. My background is in the financial industry. Okay. I spent 35 years doing that and retired and then decided to come back to work because I was bored. And so we started doing real estate. And believe me, being in real estate is not boring at all, <laughs> anything <laughs> but that. And right now, our main focus of investing has been in senior citizens community, the 55 and over communities. And we did one house, so I think we sold it back in November and we're finishing up on a second house. And due to changes in the market, we're actually changing our focus to doing more of wholesaling. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll dig into that in a minute. And, and Angie Lawrence here. And my background is in business. I've been a, a small woman-owned business owner for an IT company in the past, retired and I love real estate. And that's something that I've always wanted to do to get into. And joining Traction Rhea has really opened up a lot of networking connections and contacts and just, you know, surrounding yourself with like minded people. It's so beneficial. It puts you in the right frame of mind. And when things are looking down and you hear other people's stories, you're saying like, well, you know, what I've got going on really isn't all that bad because, you know, we're doing stuff. So it's very exciting. And, you know, all the different exit strategies where we've been doing a little bit of all of those things and finding our niche. And I love the rehab. He hates the rehab, <laughs> but I'm the designing kind of person. And so we're working on this second project. As he said, we're finishing it up and I'm designing a fabulous kitchen, which I'm very excited about. And so I'm very excited to get it to market. Excellent. And hopefully the pricing will be on an upward trajectory when we get that done. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add also is that on this particular project, I basically gave Angie an unlimited budget and she exceeded it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? I've got good taste. <laughs> Dan, you got to be careful about that. Yes, I know. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to over rehab for the neighborhood. I get that. <laughs> True. No, and then one thing I forgot to mention also is that we have been investing in other people's projects. And right now we're, we've invested in two other projects. Excellent. So you got projects of your own, your basically private lending, investing in the other projects. You've got yes. a lot of different types of avenues going on. Correct. But you know what I actually want to start with? Because you're hinting at it now. Let's talk about what's it like as a married couple working together and investing together. And it ah. sounds like there's nothing but strict <laughs> agreement on absolutely everything. Well, Tom, you remember I told you one time when you were asking me about coaching, I told you that I don't need a coach. I need a referee, <laughs> you know, WWE style, you know. And you know what? Your coaching program is just the best answer for that because you have a mediator, you know, <laughs> that can say, well, take a look at it from this perspective. And then your spouse can say, well, okay, somebody else is saying the same thing. Maybe I ought to open my mind to it, to other possibilities. But really, it's a lot of fun because we get, I'm the creative person. He's the finance guy. So we have our own skill sets. And where we come into conflict is when I have my designs. He says, no, this is the budget. And you got to squeeze it down into that. And so it's a challenge sometimes. But it's fun working together to, you know, complete a project together. It's something that we, you know, it's something we do together and it's fun. Well, I'm going to be a pain in the butt and ask, what about the times where it's not that fun working together? What do you guys do? Because I admittedly, 
I didn't design the program as marriage counseling. Or yeah. I mean, I'm glad it's worked out that way, but, but <laughs> why don't you walk me through, talk me through some of those. Some of those I times. have a voodoo doll with little stick pins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Stanley, you oh. go ahead <laughs> on that one. You take that one. You know, well, you know, being a married couple can be a challenge. You know, the upside is that gunplay has not come into your city yet. There's been no gunplay, but, you know, it can be a challenge when you're really, you know, I'm on the finance end and I'm saying, you know, well, we really can't do this. We shouldn't do this, whatever. And she's on the design end saying, well, we have to do it because if we don't, nobody's going to buy the house in this condition. Yeah. Whatever. If we want to take it to that next level of pricing, you have to give value for that and you have to spend money in the project to bring it up to that level. And one other thing that we've done too is we have set comps in the area. Okay that where we've been selling, you know, everybody was saying on the last property, no, you're not going to get 340. No, you're not going to get 344 for it. So we ended up getting 337. But still, that was about 20 grand higher than a previous sale, you know, with the same, you know, number of bedrooms, square footage, condition of the property. Yeah, I so. told him I wanted the pricing to go up. And so we did get more. <laughs> but okay. honestly, it can get very frustrating. And the bottom line is when you're working as a team, you don't go to bed angry at each other. You know, that's the main thing. Right. You still love each other at the end of the day. It's just a project. You have tomorrow to work on it again. And, you know, you just have to separate yourself from the personal relationship and put it down on a piece of paper and do your Ben Franklin, you know, the left side and the right side and come to an agreement with, you know, what makes sense. The pros and the cons, a list. Pros. On exactly. The pros and exactly. Cons. So you just have to keep the emotions and the tempers down to be able to speak to each other in a kind way. <laughs> And also you have to, you know, worry about, I think the biggest problem is unanticipated problems. Like, you know, the first day we had an open house, the agent got robbed. Okay. As yes. they were opening the door to the house for the open house, she got accosted. And so, you know, that, of course. Let's not let that one just fly, by the way. Tell me that story in more detail. Well, what had happened was that, the, like Angie says, the agent was, you know, bending down to get the key. And the next thing she knows, somebody's behind her saying, I have a gun. I want your money. Yeah. Okay. And the person that broke it up was a prospective buyer. Yes. He came onto the scene. He was walking up to go to the open house. The first and day the robber day. freaked out and left. But, you know, like, what a way to start your marketing, you know? And what happened with that property after that? Was it, did it have a stigma? Did it get a curse or was it? No, we eventually sold it, but we also had, you know, shortly after that was when the hurricane came through. Got you. So what happened was we were at 35 days and one showing basically. Okay. Because the following week after the robbery, I mean, you know, it the fe went female on. agents were still freaked out basically. Okay. So, and I understand that, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's and, very troubling, you know? Yeah. And we put it on next door for our neighbors to be on the lookout because this was a person who had previously, you know, done this in the community. And so we got very positive feedback from the neighborhood and whatever. Thank you for letting us know about it. And, you know, we had the storm intervention, which gave it a time to cool down. And then after the storm, and by the way, our storm windows held up and it, no water came into the house. It was, you know, in perfect condition. You didn't lose any shrubs or anything? Didn't lose That's any right. shrubs. So you, you rebuild it right. You rebuild it strong. Obviously, yes. that's proven by storm testing. But that combination of that kind of one-two punch between the robbery i guess she wasn't robbed but i mean the agent being held up at gunpoint then a storm coming that knocked things off for quite a while 
What did that do to you guys? And what did it do to the deal, the numbers in the deal? What did that do to you in terms of your confidence in being able to move this deal? And did you have enough to weather the storm? Pun intended. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> I think the main thing was when the agent came to us and asked us, you know, she says, well, maybe you need to lower the price. Well, mm-hmm. as anybody knows me knows I'm a contrarian. Okay. If, if everybody's going left, I'm going right. Okay. So what we did was we, and she was very open-minded. We sat down, we had a conversation. We talked about what we need to do in order to sell the house. And one of the things was social media. She was able to bring in her social media person. Plus, and I think you have a copy of these. She prepared three boards that I guess are like 18 by 24. They sat on an easel. One was was before rehab, one was after rehab, and then one was an exact listing of everything we did. Yeah. And then we raised the price. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and and the thing is, you know, they always prepare the handouts when you come into an open house. But a lot of people don't read that stuff. They just walking through the house and you can say, oh, it's got a new this and a new that. But it doesn't really register. The dollar signs don't really register in their brain. But when you have an open living room and the only thing in it are these three big easels with these placards, they take time to stop and look at the pictures. And you see the one board and it's got the way that it looked. And then with each room, and then you have the next one with what it looks like now. You can see the transformation. And then you have the list of every single thing that has been replaced, renewed, added to, you know, all the enhancements and features and everything. And they stand there and they actually focus on that and they read it and they can just glance around. And now it really has value because they've taken the time to put their attention strictly to these tools, these visual tools to help them understand the value of the house. And I think that made a real big difference. So I would highly recommend that, you know, be something you would do in open house settings. The first day you have an open house is to have placards there. I think it's an absolutely brilliant technique because like you say, people, it's no longer, well, oh, it's fixed up, but I wonder how well it's fixed up. I wonder if it's just a lipstick on a pig type of renovation. They're able to look and see that, no, a lot of stuff was actually done. And so it it actualizes that entire multi-month process that you went through to make it look as nice as it does. Exactly. It adds a comfort level to it. So I like to see rehabbers do that in general now on the resales. I think you have Mm -hmm. to more Mm -hmm. than ever, particularly if you're trying to you know, there's competition out there. There's other properties out there that they're looking at. I think the ones that do this stand apart. Yes. And like, for instance, one of the really big visual transformations, well, there's two, but the laundry room had the hot water heater and it was, you know, just kind of creepy looking. And we moved the hot water heater out into the garage right outside the door and that totally trans because now we had the room I put cabinets in there for either storage I put hanging shelves next to the dryer etc which you couldn't do with that stupid water heater sitting in the way with all the dust and the rust and and all that stuff and when you see that on the board you see what the laundry room looked like before and now what it looks like it's like wow yeah and then we yeah. also took out took a out wall the, we took out the door to the laundry room also the one that went into the yeah. garage yeah was... they had a door that was an access to the garage where you could drive your little golf cart into the laundry room to add to the dust and the dirt while you're taking out your clean clothes from yes. the dryer, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, solving some of the problems that are mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Is, well, is you know, that's really what shocked. they did back in the 70s. You know, that was the thing. So we had to bring it to modern times. And we took out a wall that was separating 
a dining room from the living room and we just opened it up so that when you walk through the door, you could see through the windows, through the back of the house, and it just made it look so spacious. It was really beautiful. I think that's one of the keys to rehabbing houses, renovating houses, is that you know people say, oh, well, why? You know, There's nothing wrong with the house. Well, it gets outdated. Styles exactly. change, the layout changes, expectations of what a house should look like or could look like have changed over time. So it's really easy to take a house from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, the 80s. And it's mm -hmm. you're starting to see it with the 90s as well. Things are different. So that's you right. get in there and spruce it up. And that's the value play you're looking for when you're rehabbing. Right. You can find something that's not going to get top dollar and fix it up on a budget, a limited budget, right? <laughs> to get it so that it does get top dollar. That's the value play we're after as rehabbers. Right. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that your customer value expectations are different nowadays than, you know, from 30 years ago. They don't want to deal with a 30-year-old looking house. You know, they want something modern and to make them feel that they're in this century. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, you know, the other thing too is that if you talk to any agent, they will tell you that marketing has changed over the past few years. Because people want to move into a house now, they want to unpack, set up their internet, and then lay on the couch. That's basically what one agent told me. That's, and, you know, she was right. That's basically, you know, what they want to do. So, you know, and the fruits of our labor, it was very interesting because when they had an inspector come in, they couldn't find anything wrong with the house. They could not find one thing to put down, you know, that needs to be done. So at the end of the day, really, it made the price, you know what I mean? There was less temptation to negotiate. Gotcha, because you know? there was nothing, there was, you didn't give them any ammunition to negotiate on. Right, and we've done this in other houses too. When we were up in the D.C. area and we did a house in Ruther Glen, the lady who came out to do the inspection, she had to basically, you know. Physically crawl under the house. Under the deck for a little piece of siding that was sticking out that, you know, when the guy came out to fix it, I think he charged me 70 bucks, <laughs> two screws to attach the little piece of siding that was hanging out. That was it. Let me expand on that point a bit. So you guys previously operated in Maryland and the Washington, D.C. area and then moved down to the Florida area. What's it like to make that transition, to transition your business, to change where you're functioning, to change where you're at? Is that difficult? Was it easy? Is there a trick to the process? Because I know there's people that think about moving, but they also think that they can't. Well, I'll tell you, you know, one of the first things we did when we got down here was we just, you know, we really pumped the real estate agents, the local agents real hard to get a list of their contractors. And, you know, if they need somebody to come in to do something, you know, who to call. So that made it pretty easy and we i think it took us what about six weeks to really put together a good team of mm -hmm. people didn't take us very long you know i also found that people down here are a little easier to deal with than people up in the you know contractors up in the dc area how so and, you know getting them to come and do work you know they sign a contract that's going to be there every day from eight to four with three other workers or whatever. And, you know, the first day they don't show up or they don't show up till noon or, well, something came up and I had to do this. Well, wait a minute now, we have a contract. The only thing that came up was us, as far as I'm concerned, because you signed a contract that said that you were going to, you know, do a specific job, okay? I just found the people up in the DC area were just very, you know, they were like really difficult to deal with compared to down here. Okay, interesting. And but from my perspective, we had a hot selling streak going through our neighborhood in the Silver Spring area. And I told Stanley, we're never going to get a higher value for our house. So we have to sell it now. And we didn't really know where we were going to go, but a friend of ours had built a house in the Tampa area. And so we rented that. So we came down with the expectation of, you know, we're renting right now. Let's find a forever home, so to speak. And so in our journey of driving through neighborhoods and getting ourselves acquainted, we started seeing all these fabulous 
investment opportunities. And so in our journey to find a home for ourselves while we were renting, we it just took us straight back into the investing side of things. So it's not really difficult. You just, you know, if you're moving into a different location, you just have to be open to seeing those opportunities, those investment opportunities, and just be curious. You have to have a mindset of curiosity, like what's here, what's there. And once we started looking into that and their sales agents all over the place, as Stanley said, you get engaged with some of them and they're very happy to share their resources and tell you who not to work with so that you don't have that experience of, you know, the fly-by-night guys and whatever. The realtor who sold us the, our first property, he gave us a great lead in our roofer. He says, he's done my roof. He's done at least 60 other houses in this community. Gotcha. He's been working here. He knows the stuff. So it's not as hard a transition as you might think you know it doesn't have to be gosh I'm not going to know anybody I'm not going to know where to go blah 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 and then you just align yourself with your local RIAs and we were so surprised to see you down here that was such a blessing such a joy I'm like oh my god Tom's down here so, but anyway, I would say, you know, if you really have your heart set on looking into it, you know, it's an adventure. Just look at it as an adventure. And us two old farts, it's like, if we don't do it now, when are we ever going to do it? So here we are in Florida and we're loving it and don't regret one day. Terrific. Now, how much does age play a factor in terms of, like you're saying, it's now or... Never. How much has that lit a fire under you that's different from maybe years past? Well, years past, you know, we had obligations and priorities and, you know, things like that that keep you tied to an area. But we're looking at this as reinventing ourselves. So it's very exciting for us. And OK, so we don't walk as fast as we used to are, you know, some of those things I used to do, you know, hard landscape, the hardscaping and the flower beds and all that stuff. Hey, I got my gorgeous George. He does fabulous work for me. I say, put it here, put it there, change this out. You know, so I just have people doing the things that I used to do myself. So it's adding a little bit to the cost, but not to the excitement and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's revitalized us, I would have to say. Yeah because yeah. it's something new it's something different and it's good for your marriage too if yeah. you start off fresh let me say and i think one <laughs> other thing too is that we went from a 5000 square foot house to a 1500 square foot house what a shock oh my yeah. gosh the thing i love to hear is when the lawn is being mowed in the morning when i wake up to the you know most people would get upset because the guys mowing the lawn at seven or eight o'clock in the morning i just turn around and go back to sleep that to me is like music to my ears but you know with a big house you know you always have some kind of problem that's going on and that was like really a big distraction and you know not having to worry about that here to me is like you know it's given me a lot more time to really put into our real estate business Gotcha. Right. I'm glad to hear it because a lot of people I always hear it's a common objection. I always wish I would have started sooner. Everyone wishes. Amen. That's so younger. true. But I think it's refreshing for a lot of people to hear that it doesn't necessarily matter when you start. Now, I guess you don't have to tell me your exact ages, but how about a decade? We're in our 70s. Right. Bingo. I want Less to hear than, that. Hey, I'm 72 and he's <laughs> going to be 74. So there you go. <laughs> We're proud of every year we <laughs> put on. <laughs> I don't blame you, right? I, and, it's, and, 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 uh, it's very inter interesting because in another mastermind that I was in, I met a guy, I think he was like 75 or 76. He was a surgeon. And, you know, we were asking him about retirement and stuff. And he said, well, let me just say that 
my portfolio, my 401k, I called it uh, two steps forward, three steps backwards portfolio. And he had to go back to work. And, you know, his wife was saying, well, you know, you can't go back doing surgery, you know, because you can't stay on your legs all day and this, and the other thing. He got into real estate and within about a year and a half, he had 12 or 13 rental properties. And I remember the last time I saw him, he came to a meeting and he goes, I just came here to tell everybody I'm done. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter, you know, when you get started, you know, don't regret it one bit. That's what we like to hear, because no matter when you start, you can build fast if mm -hmm. you pay attention to what's going on. And I think it also gives you some perspective. You've seen a lot of different markets. You've seen things rise, fall, stay flat. But there's an exit strategy for everything. You were hinting at that when we first started talking today was that you've changed with, as the markets change, as the opportunities change, as you know, some doors open, some doors close. But there's always something open. You just have to learn how to recognize that and head in that direction. And like you, know, like you said, if something goes one way, you go another way. I mean, this is the only business I've been in where you can make market, you can make money whether the market goes up, down, or sideways. Bingo. You just have to, you know, know that, okay, this isn't working. I'm going to adjust. If you have a situation where you buy a house at 70%, 60% ARV, and then all of a sudden the prices start dropping, you can always put a renter in there to cover your overhead until the prices go back up. Then you sell the house. I mean, there's always something that you can do. And, you know, I have an expression that if you don't know how to do it, you better get on the phone and call somebody. And <laughs> I'm not bashful about doing that. So if we have any questions about certain things, how to approach certain things, we have you, we have Mark, we can call. And it, that, that one that, of the that's big, a help. It is a help. Is that one of the big things that drew you into my program? I mean, is the ability to be able to ask questions and get answers? That and the fact that you are local. Okay. Because I think, you know, people, if they're going to get involved with a mentor, you really need to be with somebody that's local, not somebody that's located in California or Arizona or whatever. I mean, somebody local that you can get on the phone. If you can't catch them on the phone, you catch them at a local meeting. That to us is really important. Gotcha. What else? What would you say? What's the number one thing you've gotten out of working with me? I would say that your comprehensive approach, you have experience in everything from getting started to the exit strategy and there and you are familiar you have expertise in well if you don't want to sell it you can wholesale it and then you have all the details going into the various different avenues you're not a vertical strategy in other words I'm teaching just lease options or whatever. You have a broad approach so that whatever the different scenarios are, you are a resource. You know that and you can help us with it and come up with other alternatives and guide us down that direction. And I think the comprehensiveness of your knowledge base and the systems that you have in place, the techniques, the forms, everything like that. You have been in it for a long time and it's you've just broken it down into a science. And I think the other thing too is that it's not just real estate. There are a lot of things that are part of real estate that a lot of people don't cover. Negotiations, okay, big part of real estate. And, you know, as I told you, I need to brush up on my negotiation skills, okay? Things get stale after a while, and you have to kind of, you know, have a refresher course, okay? I think the forms that you have, okay, having the right forms are very, very critical in this business. And a lot of people have forms, but they don't upgrade their forms, okay? They don't, you know, as times change, you know, your forms should change. Okay. Or it's not applicable for what you're trying to do. Right, right. And once again, I mean, you have that. And, you know, I can sit there and read through somebody's forms and I can say, oh, wow, like this thing has been updated recently. Or like, wow, this hasn't been upgraded. This hasn't been restructured or upgraded in 10 or 12 years. 
And that's like real important because what's applicable back then is certainly not applicable now. I mean, we know everything has changed. So yeah, lots of changes is kind of a nonstop constant. Absolutely. But the other thing that I was going to say that he was bringing up is the fact that there is a pattern of thinking of how to approach problem solving that you have created a system. It's those Venn diagrams. You have your own system of Venn diagrams that they it works if you key into it. It's negotiation. It's all those different things. It's analytical thinking and you've got it drawn out. I'm a very visual person and you know, I can hear things and process and it makes sense, but trying to put it, I have to see it like, and that's what you've done. And I really like that because it helps me understand and learn it better and actually apply it in our business. Interesting. I've usually found that it's tricky sometimes because people want to get a very specific, like there's only going to be one path and one way of doing things, but you think about it, that doesn't really sum up anything in life. There's, yeah. there's multiple choices. It's exactly. So I find it better. How do you define the overall parameters of what the problem is and put a structure in place that lets you freestyle within that framework so that you're still moving through it and getting the result you're after, even though you're not sure exactly what that path is going to look like up front. And I think that's the problem. People get too rigid in their teaching. You can get too rigid in your learning. Uh, yes. And it only works for one scenario. Every time that one scenario happens, but what about all the other scenarios that life throws you right. away? You have to have right. a, a method, a way of dealing with them. Yeah. The one thing that bugs me, and it just drives me nuts for years and years when I hear people say, that's the way it's always been done. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the question is, and how's that working for you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, it might have once worked, but not anymore. Yeah. yeah. So and it's funny because people, when they get to be our age, their minds are kind of closed. They're not open to new things or whatever. We're always open to new things. Okay. I mean, because that, like you said, that's life. You know, life is always changing. Now, how much of that comes from what you mentioned earlier, Stan? You said you're a contrarian, that you tend to, you take pleasure in going the opposite way from the crowds running, but it's why? Why are you finding more success in the opposite direction from what everyone else says? Because everybody's going over here and there's more competition, whereas I'm going over here and there really isn't any competition. The opposite okay? And, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. We just sent out a mailer, okay, where we just started a marketing blitz. We sent out about 300 letters for foreclosure, pre-foreclosure, list patents, you know, that type of thing. Yes. Right. Most people, when they get the postcards back or when they get the letters back, that no forwarding address, no, no, this, everybody just kind of, you know, tosses them in the trash can. And I'm sitting there saying, man, bring those to me, you know, let me deal with it because nobody takes the time to really research to find where these people are really at, okay? And to me, when I get something back that says vacant on it, you know, NFA, no forwarding address, I'm going to jump right into that because obviously that person's moved out of the house and if it's a vacant house, it's a, it's a whole different opportunity. Yeah. Right. And most people don't go that far. Most people just say, well, I'm just going to go for the low hanging fruit. You know, well, everybody else is doing that too. I don't want low hanging fruit. You know, I want something that takes a little work to find the person, because if you find that person, you have a pretty good chance of being able at least to have a conversation with them you know, find out where their pain is and then come up with a solution for that problem. Yeah, There's a lot more reward in it. Let me ask both of you, what would you have done differently? I mean, if you can go back and tell yourself of a few years back to do something different, what's the advice you give to a younger you? Get involved in real estate early. <laughs> That's serious. And I mean, I was in the leasing and finance business and I made a good living. I really did. I made more money than i probably deserve to make, you know, doing that. But I think real estate is even better because when you're in the finance business, you know, the big thing is what's your rate? What's your monthly payment? What it's almost like you're a commodity. Okay. 
versus this business here where we can at least come up with three or four or five different solutions to whatever our client's pain is. Okay, so I feel you have a much broader area to work within than you would from what I was doing before, because, you know, people really didn't care about, well, our service, our contract is less intrusive, you know, that type of thing. They just want to know what the price is, and that's it. Whereas here, you have several different areas. If somebody approaches you and say, well, the price is too high, okay, why do you feel that way? You know, that type of thing. And then the conversation goes from there. And you can go ahead and overcome the objections that they may have. Gotcha. Angie, what would you have done different? Well, it all depends on your life circumstances, too. Because Stanley is my third husband. He's my keeper. So depending on what you're going through at the moment. But if this is something that you, as an individual, regardless of your marital status... If it's something that you want to do for yourself, then you will find the time to devote to the work that needs to be done and just get started with it. You're going to have a lot of noise and distractions of your everyday life that you're living in, your nine to five job and whatever. But if you really want to get into real estate as your lifestyle. It's it really, honestly, it's a lifestyle change because you're not working nine to five and punching in a clock. You're at Home Depot with the kitchen designer at eight o'clock at night. It's when the opportunity strikes, you have to see it and work on it. And I would just say you have to push forward and make those dreams a reality and just don't let anything else carve out the time that you need to do what you want to do and move forward with it rather than letting all of the other noise get in the way, get in the way and rob you of your time. So your advice to somebody hesitating is? Why are you hesitating if it's a lack of knowledge? Get involved with Tom's programs. That is really, life is a learning, it is a learning process. And, you know, even in our 70s, we're still learning. If you're not learning, you're not growing. And if your hesitation is lack of knowledge or you don't know anybody, you know, join your Traction RIA, get involved in the wonderful boot camps. Tom has a fabulous boot camp, but you get involved in these and just, Consider it higher education for yourself and just do it. And that will move you through the process, but you got to put in the work. That's the bottom line. Gotcha. Stan, what would you say to somebody hesitating? I would just say, do it. Just you know, put on your big boy pants, your big girl pants, whatever, and just do it. I mean, probably most of the people that we have met in the boot camp. well, I don't like to get on the phone. I don't like to cold call. Well, you need to just do it, you know, just if somebody gets mad at you or insults you or whatever, you know, you just put them down as a definite maybe and you move on to the next guy, you know, that's and the thing. See, and I've done cold calling all my life. In fact, I love cold calling because, you know, he yeah. plays with people on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. You know, especially, you know, with some guy, you know, no, I'm not going to sell my house. And, you know, you're stealing my house from me or whatever. So it's like, okay, so can I put you down to death and maybe that kind of thing. And every once in a while, somebody will start to laugh and then they'll realize and, and they'll kind of open up to you a little more. But my feeling is if somebody says no, it's not no, it's just not now. Put them down for a follow up. Very easy. If you have to leave a voicemail message form, it's, hey, this is Stan. I talked to you a few weeks ago, just wanted to see if you had any luck on selling your house. You know, if you get a moment, please give me a call. 10 second message. That's it. It's only scary because you think you don't know anything, but you actually, your life experiences have prepared you for empathizing with customers and things like that. So getting on the phone is not really as scary as you would think it is. 
And okay, so you're going to have some crabby people on the other end. I mean, you know, you have crabby people in the grocery store for crying out loud. You know, you just deal with it and move on. So just look at it as an adventure, as an exciting opportunity to meet people and help people out of their situation, because that's what you're doing is, well, if it's an occupied house if it's a vacant house then that's a different story but see that again that's why I love your program and what you have to offer is you are prepared to help with you know a, just a wide variety of scenarios and come up with a reasonable exit strategy and if things change hey okay you know let's move to this other strategy so it's just a question of educating yourself and connecting yourself with the right people to help you move forward. And don't be afraid to ask for help. And I think the other thing too, is that, you know, just people have to really step out of their comfort zone. And I think that's the big thing. Just step out of your comfort zone and do it. Okay. And when I talk to a client <laughs> on the phone, I've always tried to come up with something that's a little different than what everybody else is doing. And I'll give you an example of this. You know, when I'm talking to somebody on the phone, I'll ask them, I say, look, on a scale of one to 10, with one being a complete teardown, 10 being you can eat off the floor, where would you rate your house? I grade it a seven. Okay, what would you need to do to make it a 10? And then you, you just go on from there because it's very surprising. People will just start telling you all about, well, you know, I really need a new kitchen. You know, the kitchen was never updated and the roof is going to need repair. And I mean, people open up to you compared to what's the lowest you'll accept for your house, which is what almost what every wholesaler does. What's the lowest you're willing to accept for your product <laughs> for your home? And you just approach it in a different way. You know, if somebody tells you their house is worth X amount of dollars, well, why do you feel that way? Where did that number come from? So, you know, I just think it's really an you have people that are afraid to talk to people on the phone. You just got to do it because you're going to fail two, three, four, five, ten times before you get it right. Yeah. And you have to get to that point as quick as possible. Otherwise, you're never going to be making any offers. And if you don't make offers. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you are with yourself on the phone and your approach. And you have to go into it with. A, an upbeat, positive mindset, not with a fearful mindset, because that comes through in your voice. So it really, the whole thing transforms yourself when you get into real estate. It transforms how you relate to people. If you catch yourself with one of those not great mindsets and you need to kind of refresh and make sure you're putting on the right front, the right face, what do you guys do to refresh and stay. Focused. I go to the beach. Okay. <laughs> I love the beach. <laughs> Do you have a happy place as well? No, to me, just doing something different, you gotcha. know, whether it's, I enjoy sitting out on the lanai. Okay. And just kind of thinking about things and, you know, just kind of freeing my mind. Okay. What can I do to come up with a particular strategy for this particular situation? So because the one thing about real estate, it's really no situation that's exactly the same. Yeah. And the other thing is the relationships that you build in community, like with the Traction Ria group and you as a mentor, what puts you in that place? Well, let's talk about it. You know, you have someone to go to and talk about it and get their perspective because you're going to get responses that's a oh, I never thought about it that way. And it'll, you know, you just, you have to be proactive in keeping your mind in the right place. Gotcha. Well, Stan and Angie, I appreciate your candor. There was a lot of very deep detail and I think people will get a lot out of that, grow as investors from it and learn from, listen to this one a couple of times because a lot of things you guys said is perfect for unlocking where somebody might individually be at and how to unlock that so they can move ahead. So I appreciate you both. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good talking Thank to you. you. Good talking to you.